What an extraordinary first set of events that have already happened here on day one. And we have another one here for you. We're so happy to see everyone that's still with us at gatherverse.live and our other social media streaming platforms and different communities and groups that we're broadcasting to right now. We have a very special guest that's here to join with us today from XR Reality. She is an expert in spatial computing, legitimately, and she is a stalwart advocate of XR, and she demonstrates it in everything that she does in her career path. We're happy to bring up Ms. Dominique Wu. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Chris. Dominique, we're so very happy to have you gather with us with a little bit of time that we're afforded to be able to explore and to be able to spend together. Apple came into the arena, if you will. It's not like it's their first time. They have Apple AR, Core, AR Kit, Google, Apple. But they've come in with the Apple Vision Pro, and they've really helped accentuate the word spatial computing, which it's certainly not a new terminology. I can remember years ago, the first time I heard it, was from Orion Bar of AWE at bringing it up. I had not been familiar with the terminology, but then coming to appreciate that this is a term that's been around for decades, uh, that's been pioneered for some time. And there's people such as yourself that have had the pleasure in not only studying it or writing about it uh, and building um, these experiences. And so can you give us a sense, since this is about evolving education, what is spatial computing from what the work that you're doing, Dominic? Uh, yeah, so spatial computing pretty much imagine like a, right now what uh, what we used to do is more like a 2D screen using uh, windows, icons, uh, menus, uh, uh, like all the uh, GUI types of UX design uh, on the 2D screen. And right now spatial computing means that the computer understand the environment, understand you. So spatial AI is a term that uh, comes after and uh, what we are, like what I am very interested about right now, I think the most important thing for Vision Pro or previously, um, like the evolving is from uh, probably start with uh, Google Glass, uh, Magic Leap, HoloLens, and then um, uh, Vision Pro uh, brought this term back again. And then spatial AI is pretty much uh, the new um, the new computing system, which computer can understand the world and understand you better. So right now, I think the most important thing is that right now we have such a good technology. This, the use case is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what term we are using, like XR AI or spatial AI, but what's the most important thing next is the use case. Yeah. We talk about that use case and there's a litany of different use cases that are used within the XR ecosystem and for those that adopt and subscribe. But now we have this interest of these generative models and the influence of generative models and diffusion models and, you know, soon to come JEPA models, world models, all the different types of large language and small foundational models where we could put them, we could deploy a small model, whether it's uh, dealing with Microsoft Pi or maybe we're dealing with Apple's Elm, uh, efficient learning management system being deployed within an HMD, within a headset. But are we only looking at headset devices and glasses in terms of spatial computing uh, capability in terms of the hardware? Yeah, so as for uh, the capabilities, so far you can see that Quad3 and uh, um, Vision Pro even though um, uh, they are kind of have different terms and different backgrounds, but they are all coming together, which means that it understand the world and map out the world. And the creator was allowed to know more about what their users, uh, for example, like uh, emotion behaviors, for example, in uh, Vision Pro, it used optical ID, which means that it can access to your iris uh, information. Iris information is the, I would say the last frontiers that human have uh, for your identity. So it understand uh, your health situation, your emotion, and also your potential disease. So pretty much, um, I would say if we start using optical ID to log in or I, I log into our device, pretty much the device will understand everything about us. And uh, for the camera right now, um, uh, mixed reality allows 
um, the entire like the the headset or the developer understand uh, where we live. Yeah, so I would say this computer system. Uh, so that's why our entire user experience will start uh, upgrade from GUI graphical user interface to NUI natural user, user interface from your eyes, hand, and also uh, uh, voice. So eye, hand, and voice integration, and it will make everything become very intuitive. So that's how like uh, in the future, maybe uh, if you see right now uh, Neuralink, um, right now, I can tell in the future, we can very easily interact with the computer. Yeah. I can see in the very near future, as we see some examples of it, since you were talking about GUI and gestural interface and thinking about accuracy and point cloud precision, uh, whether that's operating in the surgical theater uh, when it comes to incisions um, using a Da Vinci's machine tele, uh, with tele remotes, or if we start thinking about the type of capture that's happening while we're using these devices with biometric uh, uh, capture, which there's an extraordinary number of concerns and folks such as uh, Britton Heller of Stanford uh, often talks about um, uh, the threat and the legal threat uh, when it comes to biometrical uh, usage um, within spatial computing XR. My follow-up to this question, uh, Dominique, let's take a few steps forward. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we have, these generative models, we have these quite capable models that are that that have fused well. That is, in a lot of ways, evolving together. Uh, a, a, an audience, we're looking at XR and AI not separate. You know, we were saying, okay, AI is the interface of XR, but we need to go a little bit higher with that. It's not just the interface of AR of XR. It is XR, and it's an extension of. And so you talked about what was most important, not the devices, but the people that wear them and, and the experiences. Give us more of a sense on where we're headed with this AI powered metaverse. Yeah, uh, recently I watched Tech Talk uh, about like Fei-Fei Li. He, she is the one of the leading uh, um, uh, person in AI uh, field. She mentioned that um, her team and uh, um, kind of start working on something that helping the uh, medical system. For example, like uh, a lot of uh, surgeons, when they are working, operating in the medical uh, kind of uh, settings, sometimes they forgot to track the, the device. So by the enhance of the spatial AI, that um, uh, it will allow uh, people to kind of start counting out the um, uh, medical um, kind of like uh, the device equipment. So it can serve as an assistant or an extra eyes for people to operate um, in the, like for healthcare people or nurse or doctors, they can become the assistant or uh, facilitate the speed of um, the or before it takes another extra person or extra time to to do things but now it reduced and uh, i also have a podcast and i interview uh, my previous um, uh, interviewer was nathan chapel he mentioned that right now you see like ai accelerate all this all this kind of like the speed up of everything for example Right now, for the doctor to have a diagnose uh, session with a patient, it takes about like uh, 10 minutes for each person. But with the AI help, for example, AI assistant, it can reduce 30% of the time. So think about that. Well, we need to, how, how can we leverage that reduced time for what we have to do in the past for the library? Should we kind of have more human touch more care about the, the patient or should we take more patient? So it's like the, 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 the thing that we need to think about it. And for everything in the world, it's the, the, the same situation. For example, like right now we do less. We have more efficient way of doing things. And so that's why the big companies start laying off people. But think about that. How can we use those efficiency time and take care uh, for more people instead of we just speed up and create a lot of things 
um, like speed is better than like we we have different track, and it depends on how how we utilize those time saving. Um, either we produce more product or we take care of more people. Yeah. And to that point, when we think about hyperscale, we think about advanced acceleration, in the uh, the advancement in the the tempo and the cadence of technology itself has really accelerated um, faster than what most technologists candidly can keep up with. And when I think about what you're expressing when it comes to even in the medical field or med tech, uh, you think about platforms like Hippocratic AI, who, you know, are just have just done an outstanding job, you know, in not only raising capital, but taking their time before going to market, interviewing thousands of doctors and nurses, and to better understand, to be able to train and deploy this model and saying, hey, there's not enough people in the health ecosystem to satisfy the needs of all the patients and people that need healthcare. And so with that said, they're saying this justifies, since we can't get enough nurses and doctors and practitioners and specialists, since we cannot get enough, we need to involve these capable model AIs to be able to come in here. Most people don't understand what form factor that they're gonna be deployed in. And that's where you heavily get involved, the XR ecosystem, especially dealing with telepresence, telecommunications and things like that, holography the things that we're talking about right now. And so dismissing the news cycles and saying that XR or the metaverse is dead, there's it's just an impossibility at this point. And they just don't understand that the growth of XR is not dependent on a news media cycle. The growth of XR is dependent on need, adoption, innovation, and applied science. And so when I look at the incredible work that you're doing with XR Reality Pro, which I do want to go and dive into in just a second here before we close, what was your desire for launching and building with XR Reality Pro, which Gatherverse has a great relationship and partnership with? Because it's one of the leading educational platforms in this space when it comes to understanding this type of technology and applied sciences. Oh, It comes back to my background. All of my family was either teacher, elementary teach, school teacher, or like a, uh, the professor in the uh, university. So I start teaching, become my, uh, became my mother's assistant since I was seven. So that's why it's very natural for me to try to explain things. It's buried in my blood. But for some reason, I was very rebellious. I told my mom I want to do something that is totally unrelated to education. So I uh, got a scholarship and studied in our center. And I did something that she doesn't want me to do, uh, which is advertising or graphic, which makes myself really busy. Um, and uh, after that, I started feeling that for some reason, I just want to learn new things. Uh, and the best way to learn things is to teach. So I told myself, let's do some cool, challenging stuff. So in the past, back in 2019, I want to learn XR because I joined a bunch of game gen and I really love like uh, how VR immersive experience. So I told myself, OK, I want to learn things. Uh, Monday to Friday, I have a full time job. I couldn't do anything. So Saturday, I gave myself four hours to learn new things. One hour, I use timers to time exactly. One hour, I eat lunch and rest, and uh, I start turning up my um, uh, video and start teaching back. So by this types of training, I create a, a YouTube channel. So Actuality Pro starts with me just want to learn things and teach back. And also, I think by teaching, I learn more. So that's kind of more like a self-training. And I also don't want to waste this entire process, and I want to just uh, create a process uh, videos for people to kind of follow up. And it, I, I just keep doing it and uh, it start become bigger and bigger. And then I, 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 I really curious about what other people think about XR. So that's why I start inviting a lot of speakers and also podcasts. And also I did some Skillshare. It's pretty much I told myself every week I need to learn something new and I love to share with people. So that's start involving with all the this big community. It's about 30K creators we reach. And uh, yeah, we, we, we had a pretty 
good um, like a branding or like a, in the industry and also a lot of XR creators uh, know us as well. Yeah. Dominique, since we're concluding now, I want to say to the audience, Dominique is a penultimate example of a technologist who has given back that which was she has freely been given to educate. I want everyone that's here, not just in the condition of a technologist, but in any profession that you have, that especially in this time of the type of technical adoption, to please find time to give back to those that have given to you. We have a roundtable discussion full of leaders that to, that do give back to others in their communities and to grow because it's critically important that Gen Alpha, as Dr. Messina Morris would talk about, they're gaining what we innovate and in leaving behind. Dominique, your work is extraordinary. I certainly wish we had more time and perhaps we will when we announce publicly Gatherverse Media. We'll look forward to being able to spend more time with you um, in the coming weeks and years and decades for however long we have uh, such the opportunity to do it. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dominique. Our gather was well. Thank you so much for having me. And audience, we're coming up on the heels of our final roundtable discussion uh, led by Christian Brown and with an assembly of uh, incredible minds 